nice that you're here. So I'll share my screen because Carmen and I have a bit of a presentation to share with you. So Glenn kind of gave you what um, we're talking about today. So at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, OSPN's education services mostly stopped, um, except for the Francophone team that did continue a bit throughout the pandemic. And then um, around January or February of 2021, Carmen and I started working together on redeveloping those services and seeing kind of what a new model would look like. And we gave um, a bit of an update in April to the community to see about like how people would like to be involved. And so we're, we're here again now in the late fall to kind of just let you know what we've been up to and where we uh, are hoping for things to go in the next six months. And my name is Amanda. As you can see, my pronouns are she and her. And I'll let Carmen can introduce yourself. Oui, Michel, je veux que tu te sentes à l'aise de poser des questions en français parce que Amanda et moi, on est bilingues. Alors, la présentation va être en anglais, mais sens-toi bien à l'aise de nous parler en français. OK, so, merci, Carmen. So, uh, Amanda and I have been working together. We're both, I'm on contract. Amanda has a, a full-time position. And uh, so we were lucky to start just about at the same time. And we've been working since February together on this. Mm -hmm. uh, so today we're speaking to you from the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Um, I think not everyone knows what unceded means. So I just like to, to bring it up. It means that there's no treaties ever down or any agreements between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people on as a, how just to um, how to share the land. So we're just completely on stolen land. So I think the point of acknowledging the land is thinking about what we want to do about the fact that we're living on stolen land. Um, the OSPN, I think we're like kind of early on in the stages of learning about how to meaningfully contribute to um, kind of reconciling that fact. We'll continue. Um, I think everyone seems fairly confident about Zoom. Oh, pardon me. Carmen, your turn. Okay. <laughs> um, these are the three objectives that Amanda and I are proposing for our conversation this afternoon. But since there's two of you, why don't you tell us whether or not, you know, what we're proposing will fit your needs or if there's anything in particular that you were curious about and that's why you decided to join us today. Uh, George. So um, <clears throat> since I've been with OSPN for quite some time now, pretty much the beginning, and I was never associated with the training aspect of it. So uh, and as you know, I volunteered to be a part of the new revised training methodology as to be someone who goes out and does speaking engagements and stuff like that. But I thought it would be, you know, a good idea just to have a good, solid foundation of how it's all going to roll out and what are all the aspects of it. So that's mainly why I'm attending today. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you, George. Um, Glenn, I'm wondering, is it possible that we can see everybody? Yeah, I'll just stop sharing for a moment. And then... Okay, so there's no way to share and see everybody, right? Uh, uh, no, there's no way to see the slide and see everybody? I, I was seeing the slide and everyone on the side. Ah. As well. Okay, ben bravo. Michel, que, <laughs> pour quelle raison que tu as décidé d'interrompre ton lunch pour être avec nous aujourd'hui? Well, uh, because I really don't 
uh, other than the name and a few Zoom uh, I've attended, I don't really know what OSPN is all about. And I guess I was not even aware that there was an educational component. So I was curious as to what uh, this is about. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll try and meet uh, those very reasonable needs that you've expressed, Michelle and George. Moving along. Okay. <coughs> so I think um, like normally we explain a little bit about the chatting on the on Zoom, but I think um, Glenn kind of gave us some information. If you have a question, you can just interrupt us with your question. That's fine. And um, if you're finding that the internet connection isn't very clear for you, maybe just turn off your camera. Sometimes it makes it clearer, but you both seem to be having no problems. Um, so the next slide will hopefully be informative for you, Michelle. Yeah. So the... Um... Uh, and George, being a long-term OSPN member, can certainly add his own historical view to it. So OS, OSPN was started around 2008 when, uh, you know, a group of people who had long been involved in the LGBT community thought that, well, we're all aging and maybe we need to do something so that we can age with dignity. So there was... Um, the, there was a, a good opportunity to do something about this because there was a three-year grant that allowed uh, Marie Robertson to work part-time on setting up this new organization. And it uh, even from the beginning, she was associated with Good Companions. So it's, it's continuing in that tradition that Amanda's working with Good Companions. But... Um, Marie started the kind of thing that we're still doing uh, all these years later. I mean, she worked with Good Companions and other organizations that she was in contact with to, uh, to see how they could become more welcoming, more sensitive organizations. And uh, she started to organize social activities and... Uh, there was a, a telephone link, uh, you know, there was, all, there was all sorts of activities that were both to connect our community to do community development so that we would feel connected as LGBTQ seniors. And then the other half of it is to make sure that we were um, well, well attended to or well welcomed in healthcare and social services. So th this has remained constant since the beginning of OSPN. It has taken various forms. For instance, I mean, there, there have been committees like the housing committee, the inclusion committee, uh, the social, uh, social, uh, social activities pieces. committee. And, uh, so this is uh, where, we, where we are at this point in time. As you know, Glenn has said that with the pandemic, most of our activities have been uh, you know, virtual, but uh, we're going strong and we're starting to do some in-person stuff. Add, add your bit of history to it, George. Yeah, I think that that's uh, pretty much it. And, um, since this talk is all about training, there was a training committee that was formed and there was people like uh, Marie involved with that and um, various other people along the way. Um, uh, Brian uh, was involved with that and Mary also, Mary Harvey and <clears throat> Lyle Borden, I know, did some training also. So they developed some modules and that sort of thing so that when people came to OSPN saying, I'm running a senior's residence and we would like to become more uh, aware, I guess, of LGBT issues. So our training committee would go out and speak to them. So you're probably going to cover some of that later, but uh, that's 
how it worked. And, and OSPN did uh, do a lot, a lot of work in creating these different modules and creating these training programs. And uh, they really had it down to a, quite an art. Um, but, you know, all of that training took its toll and the training committee was just overloaded and a number of them fell away and uh, it needed a revamp and that's where uh, Carmen came in to revamp it all. So I hope that's a bit of a good backgrounder. Good, George. And <clears throat> Amanda is the one who's most involved in what's, what's happening right now. So what is OSPN up to at this point in time, Amanda? Mm -hmm. So I guess from my standpoint, I was honored to be hired in January at the Good Companions, but in partnership with Ottawa Senior Pride Network um, to do mostly like in-person programming. And I, I wasn't able to do that right at the beginning. We did have a walking group over the summer, which was a lot of fun. And I, I did some virtual things throughout the last few months, uh, working on programs that already existed at the Good Companions. And then this, um, just a few weeks ago, we started two Saturdays per month to have the Good Companions open specifically to LGBTQ2 seniors. And we have like tons of different activities going on. And we're having a bit of a, like a, trying to take it slow to start with, but I think in the new year, it's gonna really blossom and, and be fantastic. And I'm really excited about it. Um, on top of that, I'm also kind of providing like some frontline social work services to some seniors. And um, so I'm, I'm happy to do that for people. And also um, I'm assisting Carmen in, in kind of like the, the coordination of um, these education services as we go forward. Shall we move on? Yep. So as, as George mentioned a few minutes ago, the the training team, which had been active for about uh, 10 years, it kind of imploded even just about as the pandemic. It was a coincidence that the pandemic came along. It did. The team kind of burnt out. The volunteers were no longer willing to, you know, meet the, the requests that were coming in. And so for uh, all intents and purposes, it, it kind of uh, training got suspended as of February 2020, uh, 2020. The French training continued, Amanda has referred to that, and they continued to do, a, they did about four sessions uh, since the beginning of uh, the pandemic. So when uh, there was a little bit of funding available to revamp and relaunch the program, uh, the, one of the concerns of the coordinating committee is that whether, or no, regardless of the kind of work that we're doing in the community, everyone should be working towards the same objectives. So this is what you have on, on the slide here. That, that, you know, whether or not it's George who's doing a speaking engagement or people doing uh, group sessions, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, we should always be striving to help people understand uh, the reality of LGBTQ2 plus seniors, to, under, to understand the impact of the reality on our lives and on the organizations who are supposed to serve us and then to clarify how to better serve LGB2 plus seniors. So there was a concern that there be a coherent and consistent message, regardless of whether or not you're having a 15 minute conversation with an executive director or you're doing a, a two hour training program that uh, you know we're working towards this. So um, I'm wondering if, at you know, we've been through a few slides now. I'm wondering if there are any questions or comments from either of you, and even from Glenn. Glenn doesn't have to be silent. No question. Okay. Um, I think I'd like to add that one of the things that um, 
the coordinating committee, which is it's, it's the governing body of OSPN. Because OSPN is not incorporated, it doesn't have a board of directors, right? It, uh, you put conseil d'administration. But what they have as a governing body is the coordinating committee. So you'll hear me referring to this periodically. When they wanted uh, you know, to, to restart the training program, one of the concerns they had I've just referred to is that there be coherent messaging, regardless of the, of the way we reached out into the community. And then they also felt that in 2021, there were issues that needed to be um, addressed and included in the training, and maybe they weren't that much uh, you know, over the, the last decade. One is to try and represent the diversity of our community. Uh, so we're, we're striving to do that in, in what we develop. The other uh, concern was that uh, gender identity is now a major issue in our community and in the community at large. And this was not necessarily referred to or paid much attention. And we're still working on how to give it the, the right kind of attention in the current training. But I, uh, you know, I did want to point out that they, they were concerned that the, the training be not just resurrected in the old format, but that it, it includes some of these new dimensions and that the, uh, the, the objectives were not only to be followed by whoever was going to be doing education, but by whoever was going to be out there in the community on behalf of OSPN. Continue. Okay. So the the types of services that are offered with in the education services of OSPN now there are three different ones. So the first one is co-facilitated group sessions. So there's a, a generic two hour session that can be kind of customized a bit to the particular group, and the, there's. The way it is now is there's two OSPN volunteers who co-facilitate those sessions. Um, the second service that George, you spoke about is what we're calling the Speakers Bureau. So that's um, if someone doesn't want so much of a workshop, just more of a, a presentation by one person, uh, often talking about something a little bit more particular. That's the second service. And the third one is organizational advice. So when organizations are wanting to change their practices or policies to make their organization more inclusive of LGBTQ2 plus seniors, that is the third one. Um, and just to give a little bit of information about what has happened in the last year or so, um, there's been about five group sessions that have been delivered over Zoom. Um, to kind of different sorts of organizations. There was a church, a couple of seniors organizations, and a couple of social service agencies. Um, there's also been some presentations given, um, all virtually at this point, and also a few volunteers have gone to give organizational advice about particular topics that um, people were needing some support in. Amanda, does the five sessions include the, the French session that was just offered? No, no. So those were all English ones that I was speaking about, those five. There's quite a few more that have been in French um, and one that's been done using the new material just very recently. Thank you for adding that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So here again, you know, you're getting an opportunity to ask questions and comments about the three services and uh, and how we want, you know, regardless of the type of service, we want this coherent messaging and this, this uh, we want it to look like 2021. Yeah, Carmen, it's Glenn. Um, I, a couple thoughts or questions and comments. I do know um, that fairly recently OSPN, and I'm just sort of mentioning this because people might be interested. Um, we ha recently had a uh, a, a presentation done virtually uh, specifically on the topic of uh, trans people uh, dealing with dementia and the sort of challenges that um, 
long-term care facilities might face when, when dealing with those kinds of issues. So if uh, anyone is interested, whether they, they be in the educational services team or just generally with OSPN, we do have that on our OSPN website because we recorded that session. So it's uh, when you mentioned um, that OSPN is trying to reach out and to learn more about gender identity. I think that that was a really great presentation to uh, to sort of feature that particular topic. It was very educational for me, <laughs> you know, listening to the presentation uh, as we were recording it. And then I guess the other question that I'm that I had just as you were talking about the new services was. Um, are these services that OSPN is uh, generating revenue from? Uh, because I know that that was, you know, part of the concern with the burnout of, of the team in the past was that, you know, that we were kind of, OSPN was sort of offering these services for free and it was, you know, the demand was quite heavy. So I just wanted to see if that was something that uh, is part of the plan. Well, you're dead on because, I mean, uh, we were asked this yesterday, uh, Amanda and I, and uh, yeah, we do want the coordinating committee to, to uh, develop a pricing policy because more and more we're, uh, we were getting asked the question and we feel that what we're doing uh, is worth something, especially when we're going to organizations that we know have huge training budgets. So, you know, if it was a group, a self-help group with no budget, maybe we'd do it for free, but it's, it makes less and less sense nowadays to, to be doing this kind of stuff, which people want to learn about because they want to better serve our community. So uh, stay tuned, uh, we will be charging. George, I think you also had a question. Uh, I did. It was more of a comment, though, mm -hmm. and, and that is uh, the th third component of the training was uh, working with groups and organizations to um, look at their policies and procedures and that sort of thing. When uh, Marie was uh, hired through that grant, she actually physically worked at the Good Companions, and she actually went through their policies and procedures like word by word to make sure that everything was inclusive. And I must say that uh, certainly the Good Companions probably is pro one of the best, most inclusive policies and procedures now uh, to include LGBT people. But I, I want to caution people that that is not, from what I understand, the intent of that third component. It's to provide advice on how people can modify and change their own policies and procedures. We're not gonna do it for them, but we're going to guide them how to do it and maybe provide a few examples. So that was my comment. Yeah, and you're, you're right in your recollection of uh, the work that Marie did at Good Companions, but this piece of work is now about 10 years old and one, we've been doing training uh, or group sessions at Good Companions. And um, it, the idea is to see whether or not there, the, there's anything in that that needs to be updated now. For sure, uh, the Good Companions is an ally and they're more than open to discussing anything that they can do to be even more welcoming of us. But it was also the only time in the history of OSPN where we did go systematically through an organization's policies and you know, recommend changes to that. It was always um, the intent of the training team, of the old training team, to do this because at the end of the training sessions, they would always say, you know, we're, we're available to help you do other stuff like look at your policies and procedures or your communications so that you know they are welcoming to us. But it was very rare that the, an organization would take them up on that. So that was another kind of, uh, another concern of the coordinating committee 
And this has to do with the way that uh, Amanda is working. The idea of working with an organization for any service is to uh, build a relationship with that organization. So that, you know, Amanda has a number of, of, of conversations before a service is rendered. She follows up, you know, a week or two after the service has been rendered. She'll follow up three months later. And the idea is always to keep the connection with the organization to say, how else could we be helpful to you? So we're trying to um, learn from the past of how this, you know, this service was always offered, but there wasn't much uptake. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't do the outreach. Like we didn't stay in contact with the organization. So now Amanda's doing this in a much more systematic way. I think you're going to talk more about that in a few slides, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And any other comments about the three services at this point? Or anything else so far? Yeah. Anything else? Um, I guess it's just, I have, it's Glenn again. I just have one other, I guess, question. Uh, I do know that um, just from my working with other OSPN members that there's often sort of a demand or a question from organizations to sort of get a, I guess, like seal of approval, like we're queer friendly, you know, is there any sort of, as part of the educational services program, is there any attempt or interest from OSPN to effectively offer that kind of thing where we're evaluating organizations and then recommending them to our members so that if someone is looking for, say, a long-term care facility uh, or, you know, a doctor or psychiatrist or whatnot, um, that uh, they're sort of, quote-unquote, OSPN approved. <laughs> I don't know if that's something that uh, is in your sort of vision or plan for the future, but I, I do know that I, I know that you get asked that question a lot <laughs> from organizations. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think George might have something to add to this, but uh, just from the educational services point of view, we've had the, this question, as you've just referred to that, we've had that question for years and years. And we have always refused to, to get into a certification process. First of all, there are a lot of standards organizations out there that have the mandate to do that, right? May, they, may, they might not have an LGBTQ mandate, but they, they can have a diversity mandate to make sure there are things in place to respect diversity. But And, and there are many reasons why we have been reluctant to certify and that we will not likely ever get into that business because it's not because an organization has one group session with 20 volunteers or employees that that makes it a completely safe place for LGBT folks. It may be those 20 fo folks are going to be more sensitive. They're going to act appropriately, but you know, that, and, uh, and we've never been in an organization where everybody had to take the training. And then we know that the reality of organizations is the executive director changes, the board changes, and all of a sudden they feel that the priority is, you know, air conditioning or whatever, right? And that they become less concerned about all of the diversity issues. So, We've, we, uh, there's even a lot of talk now that we, we shouldn't encourage organizations to even put up a pride flag unless they've done quite a bit of work. Because if, if they, uh, you know, we used to say, put up a pride flag to show that you're welcoming to our community. But then that was a false safety because somebody could go in and they'd be treated really badly. It's not because there's a pride flag in the window. So, so the whole issue is now we're evolving in terms of even, you know, things like uh, pride flags that they, it needs to come later in the process, not as the first thing. And certification is really not 
in uh, in the offing. Now, uh, you know, I, I, I know George gets requests sometimes to recommend doctors or recommend uh, different kinds of services. And how have you dealt with that, George? So <clears throat> I can speak to a couple of those issues. I mean, there are organizations like Rainbow Health Ontario and that sort of thing that offer uh, training and that sort of thing. And there are, are some groups and organizations, uh, for example, SAGE in the United States, they have a fairly extensive training program and they do offer some type of certification. But I totally agree with you, Carmen, that uh, a, 20, a course to 20 people in an organization uh, and then the executive director changes and they think about air conditioning then that certification is absolutely totally useless. So I don't think we really should go down that line, uh, that, that road of doing any type of certification. And also there's liabilities that come along with that. Uh, and, and let's face it, OSPN is not an organization that could stand a, a lawsuit or anything like that because we're just a bunch of volunteers. We're not even incorporated. So best to put that totally aside. Um, on the other issue of the resource list that we have, uh, which lists doctors and massage therapists and that sort of thing, we clearly state there that these are people that have been mentioned to us by members of OSPN who have used their services and were pleased with their services, but it, it's only um, a suggestion of the people who have been, uh, you know, in our community that have been served by these people and they've been happy and felt that they were OS, or LGBT welcoming. Uh, but we do have a disclaimer in that, uh, in that list anyways, and we encourage everybody to do their own research. Okay, I think we can continue on. Thanks everyone. Uh, yeah, I didn't hear what George said in the last while because my my connection was unstable, but I'm sure it all made sense. He, he was referring to the resource list. And I think he was saying that any people on the resource list does, doesn't mean that OSPN is recommending them. Yeah, it's a good summary. So we, th we thought at this point in time that we, you, you, you might be interested in knowing concretely how does this uh, unfold. So that's why we thought we'd tell you a little concretely about uh, our day-to-day -day work. So there are three aspects to running the educational services program. The first one is roster development, is getting a group of volunteers prepared to, uh, to offer the service. The second one is organization outreach, is who are we offering this service to? And the third is the service development. What exactly are we offering when we say we offer these three services? So I'm going to speak a bit about the uh, roster development and Amanda will continue with the other two aspects. Uh, as of April, we started recruiting people who would be, uh, you know, interested and available to, to offer the three services, the group sessions, uh, a speakers bureau and organizational advice. And uh, it was deemed that people who were uh, doing this work uh, before the training team folded, they, if they were interested in doing it again or resuming the work, they would be automatically included as volunteers. So that, that uh, includes a, a few people. But we then reached out to, uh, an, you know, about 45 active OSPN members, people who uh, 
yeah, I've been doing different kinds of volunteer work for OSPN. And they were invited to an information session in April. Amanda referred to that earlier, which is the last time before today where we reached out to the whole membership. And in April, we described the way the, you know, the services would unfold and invited people to register on the roster. Since then, Amanda and I have interviewed people who were interested uh, and who were not part of the old team, or people like George who have been doing it, but you know, to make their participation official in, in the educational services program. And then we've, we've started a process for co-facilitators of group sessions, uh, you know, a four or five step process that would get them up to par so that they could co-facilitate a group session. At the moment, the other two services were, we've been basically gathering material that can be available to somebody who's doing either a speaking engagement or organizational advice. So the, the roster development, the developing the group of volunteers who are going to be offering the, th the three services is ongoing. That's about it. Okay. Um, in terms of organizational outreach, um, there were quite a few organizations who had been put on hold in March, 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. So when I, shortly after I started in January of this year, uh, I reached out to them to let them know, like we, we are in redevelopment. And if you're still interested in receiving services at some point, like that will be available. Um, so basically everyone that we have um, done group sessions for this year in 2021 in English, were from that group or people that are very closely connected with OSPN already. Um, into the future, I think once we're really completely ready, there'll be more like widespread advertisement of these are services that we want to offer you. Um, but right now that's, that's what has been done. Um, and as for service development, that also in this is it includes the relationship with organizations. So while I'm not um, co-facilitating sessions, I am kind of doing that relationship with, with organizations. So that was involved in contacting them at the beginning, seeing where they were at, what they needed, um, arranging all the logistical details of having a session and who would be there, how many people, um, lots of small things to think about. And then following up in a systematic way that Carmen and I have decided on and um, seeing like how we can support organizations after they received a service and, and keeping in contact with them. Um, and Carmen, if you want to add anything to that or if you'd like to talk about the materials involved in the service development, that would be helpful. Yeah. So Amanda's described the process, what happens when she starts the relationship with an organization. I'm going to tell you a little bit within service development what it is that we did develop. Uh, you know, we looked at the, the training that was offered before because there's good parts to that. And we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So, and uh, early on, Amanda and I in the early spring looked at what was offered out there. Uh, George has, has talked about Rainbow Health and... Uh, you know, there are various other organizations doing training. What we found is there's a, a fair amount of work being done to sensitize um, schools and young people. And that's great so that they don't have to suffer bull bullying or whatever, but there's still virtually nothing done around seniors. And it would have been great to be able to connect to a network of organizations doing educational services around the reality of our lives, but uh, that's not the case. But we did get a chance at least to see who is doing work on this issue. And um, that's part of the relationships that Amanda is continuing because we did get some great allies in other organizations. 
But at the end of this process of uh, seeing what was happening elsewhere, taking good stuff from the past, making sure there was some diversity and some gender identity included in, in the new uh, materials, we, we now have a generic two-hour outline that can be modified, it can be shorter, can be longer for a group session. We have some generic slides that can be used either in group sessions, but they could also be used by somebody doing a speaking engagement. We've got some pretty comprehensive slide notes so that people you know, can learn more than just the few sentences on the slide. And we've, we've developed a, a standardized group of handouts that we think organizations could find uh, useful. And again, these could be used by people doing organizational advice or doing a speaking engagement. So I, uh, so this kind of covers some of the, uh, the main points around how we're trying to work on these three levels as we develop educational services. And another question period. No questions for me. All good stuff so far. Okay. So let's. Michel, it's in question, Michel. No question for me. And Glenn. I'm good too. Yeah. <laughs> I think this has all been really fascinating. Thanks so much for uh, all, all the uh, presentation you've done so far. And so we're, we're, we're going to be concluding with giving you a glimpse of, um, you know, what, what about 2022 and beyond. So uh, what we're going to be doing is continuing to expand the roster of volunteers. We know that there's a few people who don't want to do anything by Zoom, but they'd be willing to do in-person stuff. So, you know, we'll, uh, we'll probably be expanding our roster somewhat, but people are willing to do in-person stuff. And in terms of the sessions we'll be offering, we're, uh, we're going to be doing four open sessions between January and June. And by an open session, we mean that we will be targeting very specific sectors of health and social services. For instance, one sector could be seniors organizations, another sector could be community health centers. And we're going to target so that one, you know, there'll be four open sessions, but one session could be for, uh, you know, uh, people who work in senior centers. We'll encourage each organization to send two people because it's kind of, um, can be lonely to be, uh, you know, be exposed to all this information and not have anybody else uh, to discuss what would be the next steps for our organization. So hopefully that'll, that'll work. So there could be, for instance, groups of 20 with 10 organizations represented to each. What we're going to try and do is have two live sessions in person at Good Companions and two Zoom sessions. Now, this is going to be an experiment because, um, you know, there has been a French session live in person, but we haven't done any in-person English sessions yet. So let's see how that goes, experimenting with some by Zoom and some in person. And while this is happening, uh, January to June, uh, where OSPN is going to try and get some money to be able to fund someone who, who could work at this two or three days a week, which is not my case, and it's not Amanda's case either. That, um, so to, to do outreach, Amanda said, you know, we, we haven't been publicizing this, the, these services because we can't meet the demand that much. We don't have a huge roster of volunteers. And we don't want to open the floodgates and we can't respond. But 
If there was funding to hire somebody who would work two, two or three days a week, then that person and the volunteers on the roster would be available to you know, do a, an awful lot more work. Now, it takes time to get some funding. So that's why we're in the meantime, while we try and get a good hunk of money, uh, we're going to be offering these four open sessions to keep the educational services program alive. And also we're hoping that by targeting specific sectors, they might, because uh, we've done open sessions under the old program, when we did, very often people from give, some organizations said, this, this was great, would you come to organize, want our organization and offer a session to us? So it is likely to yield some demand beyond uh, the spring. So those are some of the ideas that we're playing with to, um, for the next six months and possibly the next year. Any comments about this? It's, you know, when, when there's only three of you, I, I keep turning to you and you're getting so much attention. <laughs> Thank you for that, Carmen. <laughs> I, it, it's nice to be the center of the universe. <laughs> I, I feel like Toronto. <laughs> Come on, George, you're not used to being the center of attention? <laughs> no, actually, you know, Glenn, I hate it. But anyways... <laughs> The point being is that I think uh, Kaiman is very correct, is that when we do these open sessions, there really is going to be a, quite a bit of uptake and we're going to get those requests coming in. And, and, I, and we really do have to be prepared for it. And uh, I know that there are a couple of pots of money that are available or will be available uh, for the next year. Uh, and uh, Kathy Collette uh, has the information on those and there's two different pots of money. Um, so uh, I know that you speak to Kathy all the time, Carmen, so you may want to put the bug in her ear that there is a huge need to have that person uh, in place that we can continue the training session on and do exactly as you described. So, chat. Well, yeah, chat. well, actually, the the idea to go for more funding comes from Kathy. The, okay. I, the idea of what we can do while we wait for the money, that comes from Amanda and I. <laughs> okay. Uh, does anybody else want to say something? I guess I'm curious too about if there's a way for volunteers to um, get involved in the program and approach you, because uh, I'm assuming like, as George says, there's going to be a large uptake. Um, and, you know, obviously that will probably mean that, you know, again, to sort of um, uh, avoid that sort of burnout of a few individuals who are doing all the work, um, you know, the more people that are assisting and participating, then it's going to, you know, alleviate it for everybody. Yeah, that, and that's part of what needs to be done um, early in 2022 is decide on uh, a recruitment strategy for the second uh, group of volunteers. And that strategy is not, has not been developed yet, but you're right, we have to.